Laser sights enhance and maintain your accuracy in a time of crisis, preventing tunnel vision and allowing quick target acquisition in awkward shooting positions. Crimson Trace, making laser sight standard equipment. Learn more at crimsontrace.com. Today on Tom Gresham's Gun Talk, it's a positive step in two gun rights legal cases, one in New Jersey, one national. Plus, encouraging new hunters and shooters to explore the outdoors, an initiative from a California gun group to help women learn how to protect themselves, and more. And as always, call us at 866-TALK-GUN with your comments, questions, and range reports. And now, here's Tom. Somebody pass me the uh, Ben Gay or the sports cream or something. Hey, Tom Gresham here. It's Gun Talk. Have you ever, like, had fun getting beat up? <laughs> That's what I just did the last week. I spent uh, a week out at gun site taking their close quarters pistol class. It's, uh, let's see. We got attacked with knives. We got attacked with billy clubs. We got attacked with guns. It, just, it is a lot of close stuff, pushing and shoving and wrestling and fighting. And it was intense and Really, really instructive and fun. I'll pass along some of the things I learned from that. One of the things I learned, and I'll tell you about that a little bit more, is that women are tough. <laughs> Don't mess with uh, the women in the class, I guarantee. And they can shoot. Oh, yeah, by the way, they can shoot really well. Uh, I got some tune-up, learned a lot of things. We'll be talking about that. Also, I shot four different pistols in the midst of this week-long class. Probably could have shot two or three more because people kept saying, hey, why don't you try this one? Why don't you try this one? Uh, one of the guns I uh, shot is a uh, cost more than $6,000 for the pistol. And others were considerably less. Shot big guns, full-size guns, shot little guns. Yeah, it makes no sense to take a little gun to a class like this, except that that may be exactly what you're carrying when that dude comes at you with a baseball bat. Are you ready? Well, we'll talk a little bit about that. We have an awful lot of things going on today, including in about, oh, 30 minutes, we'll have a report, a range report from somebody who uh, says he saved his life from a four-legged critter with a 10 millimeter. That's going to be interesting. And a whole lot of other things, things going on on the uh, national front, legal side, what uh, is happening with guns and ammo, shotguns, rifles, handguns, it doesn't matter. If you want to talk about guns, this is your place because, yeah, after all, it is called gun talk. That's what we do here. Our number is 866-TALK-GUN. That's how you get in here. It's real simple, okay? Or just call Tom Talk Gun. Uh, I want to quickly go to our first guest. Evan Knappen has been on this show many times, maybe one of the, probably the first lawyer we ever had on the show some 20 some years ago. He is the gun guy when you need an attorney in the state of New Jersey, and things are happening there that I think may have national implications. He joins us right now. Evan, welcome again. Hey, thanks. Glad to be on board. And you know that, that gun site experience you had sounds like a lot of fun. But I, but I got to tell you, you could get the same training for free if you just walk the streets of Camden, New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready for that one. You know, like the guy says, just uh, are you man enough to do that? I don't know. Some of the women in the class could probably do it, but I don't think I'm up for that. I'm sure. <laughs> right. Well, great to oh, be on man. That. Well, look, first of all, let's do this. Uh, first of all, tell them what the New Jersey law is that you're kind of running up against, and then we'll talk about the case itself, okay? All right. The New Jersey law is, this is important, really, for the entire country because yes. it, it, what it does is it, it, you know, like people say, oh, the president talks about fake news. Well, New Jersey has what's called a fake license. I call it a fake license. Their carry license is a license that actually no average law-abiding citizen can get. So even though it purports mm -hmm. to be available, in reality it isn't. And that's because of two words. Two words that the court has uh, been incredibly judicially dishonest about and has formulated into a bar so right. that an average citizen cannot get a license. Those two words are justifiable need. And they've taken the term justifiable need, taken, extracted the word justifiable, and said that means justification. Justification is the legal word for self-defense. They then require that you show that you need to use deadly force before you need to use deadly force, uh, giving no consideration, by the way, to non-deadly force, which the majority of firearms that save people from crimes and right. the, the still use non-deadly force with a firearm. They don't consider that. So you have to make this showing, essentially, that you need self-defense before you need self-defense 
to you personally. Well, so tell me exactly, uh, hey, Evan, what are you talking about? I mean, what do you have to be able to prove, or what do you have to show, or what kind of uh, encounter do you have to come to the board with before you, you can actually be go. granted this? No problem. You have to show what is called urgent necessity, and the court has created a two prong test, in effect, where you have to show that you personally are subject to a serious threat of bodily injury or death, and that carrying a handgun is necessary for that defense. So basically, if you've been shot and killed, you qualify for a carry license. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're laughing, but it, but it is, it's laughable, but it is serious. What it actually means is that unless you are, frankly, politically connected, or have made right. massive donations to somebody, you're not getting a permit. Well, that's how it works, because in a state of over 10 million people, there's only 600 carry licenses issued. And remember, they're issued by judges. They're the issuing authority, which we've raised as an issue in and of itself. Mm-hmm. Why are judges uh, performing an executive function? And it's completely confidential, so you can't discover who the politicians and mobsters who have the licenses, you know, they're the only ones getting them. Wow. So this is the corruption of New Jersey when it comes to Second Amendment rights. Okay, so now talk about this case. Well, the case we have is uh, the uh, been accepted by the New Jersey Supreme Court, and it's Calvin Carlstrom case, and he is a, uh, folk, a person who is a security guard, particularly for movie theaters, by the mm-hmm. way. Okay. He's a, uh, uh, retired Marine, fully trained, uh, great guy, and uh, the and it was determined by his chief, who was the first level of scrutiny, the chief approved his license, approved it. Okay. And then it went to the judge, who without a hearing denied it, nothing on the record, just said, no, I don't think he has justifiable need. And what did he have? All he had was a chief's approval. You know, and so who is this judge to override the chief who knows the situation, knows wait, the... Wait, wait, what, you, mean, you mean to tell me that Mr. Carlstrom did not get to appear before the judge and make his case? At no time. Because he was because New Jersey's laws were written in such a way, you only get a hearing if the chief denies you. You see, the legislators, back when they concocted this, never thought... I believe that if you were approved by the chief, that any judge would not issue the license. They're, so they didn't even put a procedure in for you to have a hearing on it. Wow. And here we have him after an approval with no hearing. So one of the issues we raised is that there's an absolute denial of due process. He's never had his day in court. He's never been able to make a record in any court. And yet here he is denied. And uh, that is one of the issues raised and, and also raised is, why are judges issuing licenses at all? In I mean, think place. about it. Of a license is an executive function. If the chief should decide one way or another, and then if you're not satisfied with that, then you have the recourse of the courts, which is what they're there for, right? To make sure there was fairness, to make sure that the law was followed. But to make a judge an issuing authority turns him into a ministerial actor of the state. Okay, now there are, there are other states, there are other jurisdictions that require um, g- good cause or something along those lines before you can get your carry permit. As you go forward with this case, I know it's a New Jersey chase, case, is there a possibility that the outcome of this case could impact other states? Well, at this level, it's a New Jersey Supreme Court case, so it would only be informative to the mm-hmm. other states. Okay. But if the outcome of the New Jersey case here is not satisfactory, we, of course, have the ability to go to the uh, United States Supreme Court with a state Supreme Court decision that raises the constitutional issues under the Second Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment and separation of powers, and to ask the higher court for review. But remember, while Carlstrom is pending in the state Supreme Court, the Rogers versus Gruel case is before the federal court seeking certification, seeking certiorari. Okay, so uh, that h- hold on to that thought for just a second. I got to take a quick break because I want to come back. This is important stuff for everybody. Anybody who's serious about self protection, carrying a gun, getting a permit, or even in a state with uh, constitutional carry, all of this applies, and you need to be informed about this stuff. We're talking with Evan Knappen out of New Jersey. Evan, quick break here. We'll come back and we'll get filled in on that one. Our number is eight six six Talk Gun. Be right back. The 
next big thing for the AR-15 has arrived. The Brownells BRN-180 Upper, a modernized version of the Armalite AR-180, featuring a 16-inch barrel, a 223 wild chamber, and a full-length pick rail. The BRN-180 skips the buffer system to allow complete function of the firearm with a stock folded or extended. Best of all, the Brownells BRN-180 mounts to any mil-spec AR lower. Visit brownells.com today. Are you looking for a place to shoot? The National Shooting Sports Foundation has a great website called wheretoshoot.org. It's the largest database of shooting ranges on the Internet. It's also a great resource for shooters where you can find video tips, printable targets, and a lot more. Find it online at wheretoshoot.org. And while you're there, download their free iPhone app. That's wheretoshoot.org. You got your carry permit, and that's good. But you know you could use more training. Get the DVDs, which have what you need. Springfield Armory presents Concealed Carry 1 and Concealed Carry 2 with Bata Group. Learn specific concealed carry skills from Top Gun fighting trainers. Get trained. Be prepared. This really is life and death. ShotgunTalk.com. That's ShotgunTalk.com. Perhaps more than any other landscape, wetlands embody the life-giving abundance that nature has to offer. And perhaps more than any other organization, Ducks Unlimited is working to ensure that our continent's wetlands not only survive, but thrive for generations well beyond this one. The time is now to band together. The time is now to rescue our wetlands. The Ruger pistol that started it all is now even better. The Ruger Mark IV has the same great look as the Mark III, but now its simple one-button takedown means less time taking apart your gun and more time shooting it. Disassemble it in seconds for no hassle cleaning. Learn more about the Target, Hunter, and 2245 Light Mark IV Series models at Ruger.com. The Ruger Mark IV, another rugged, reliable firearm from Ruger. In a few minutes, I'll tell you about uh, how I've kind of changed my view on carry guns. It's part of the aftermath of my class at Gunsight. Also, a uh, report on uh, one of the ladies in the class just rocking a Glock 48. Amazing stuff. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk with uh, Evan Eppen from uh, New Jersey about uh, a couple of cases. And Evan, you were moving on to the second. Is that the Rogers case you said? Yes. Rogers also started out as my client. And it was great because uh, the NRA and our state association, uh, AJRPC, uh, and you know, you know Scott Bach, who's mm-hmm. our executive sure. director and all, we coordinated, and that case went down a federal path. And uh, that case with Mr. Rogers, he's a guy that works on ATMs in bad areas, has all kinds of cash, and uh, and is going around fixing and filling and repairing and uh, you know cash machines, and he's denied a carry license for mm. not having sufficient justifiable need. Right. So this is uh, this case is also at the moment that one's pending before the United States Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court has ordered New Jersey to supply a brief, which is a very encouraging sign. And their brief is due April 19th, and we may see that case accepted as they have accepted the New York State rifle and pistol case, which I know you've talked about before. And that's really going to be great because uh, finally, if they take it, this arbitrary creation of a standard will be addressed, and hopefully the court will address the application of the Second Amendment outside the home and address the application in terms of the level of scrutiny. And, of course, we want to see a declaration by the top court in the land that it is strict scrutiny in terms of our Second Mm -hmm. Amendment rights, because historically, under strict scrutiny, 70 percent of the laws challenged under strict scrutiny fall 
as unconstitutional. No. So when we get strict scrutiny as a national standard, you can expect to see 70 percent of the gun laws challenged being knocked out as unconstitutional. So you know, there's a lot that we have going on fighting and the antis are, you know, funded beyond belief by uh, Bloomberg and such. Right. We still have basis for some optimism here because we are making great strides in the court. Hey, Evan, let me ask you, and I'm not a lawyer. I have watched a lot of uh, lawyer TV shows, though, okay? So that's my qualification. <laughs> this may sound like a dumb question, but when they require, various states, they require you to show good cause or justification in order to exercise your Second Amendment rights, I mean, my comeback is, well, I don't have to show good cause or justification to exercise First Amendment rights. Is that just one of those things that people say that has no meaning, or is there actually a, a, some kind of a basis for discussion with that idea? Here's the way New Jersey, will say, gets away with it, or as, as arguably at the moment, at the moment. Mm-hmm. Because at the moment, they're claiming that our Second Amendment rights don't apply outside the home. Ah. And you can require that, which, of course, is silly. I don't think the shot heard around the world at Lexington and Concord was fired from the Patriots' bedroom. You know? Uh, hey, come on. You know, they carried the gun there, right? right? So this is what we're talking about. But they've made that distinction because Heller and McDonald, et cetera, uh, did not specifically address outside the home. It was focused on inside the home. And right. so that's where hopefully uh, the New York State rifle and pistol case or some other case accepted by uh, SCOTUS will make that clear that, no, nope, that argument doesn't fly. The right to keep and bear arms applies inside and outside the home. And by the way, the standard is the highest as for all fundamental rights. And that's when we're going to start seeing major, major change Be- because uh, then attorneys can uh, go after these statutes, get paid attorney's fees under these civil rights acts, by the way, and have that high level of scrutiny to win. Uh-huh. And uh, a new dawn for the Second Amendment. It, it, it would the- be a wholesale change in the way the Second Amendment is supported and thought uh-huh. of. Let me do this, Evan. I'm going to give out your uh, websites. Evan Knappen, E-V-A-N-N-A-P-P-E-N dot com. Evan Knappen dot com. And when you look at this uh, this case and this information, there is a link there. If you would like to contribute, throw some dollars to help uh, with these important cases, that would help out. This stuff's expensive. Evan, thank you so much. You are always on the leading edge, man. Oh, I love it, and thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Absolutely. You take care. Yeah, boy, how that would be amazing. According to him, 70% of the laws that are challenged under strict scrutiny fall if we had the U.S. Supreme Court say that the Second Amendment should be judged with the criteria of strict scrutiny. And it's a legal term, but we are starting to understand this, those of us who are not lawyers. According to Evan, you could expect 70% of the gun laws to go away. Man, that would be huge. All right, let me tell you about this class I took. Um, and, you know, and I've talked about going to some of these really good shooting schools out there. I'm talking about um, SIG Academy, Thunder Ranch, Gunsight, uh, Shoot Right. And there are a number of other ones out there. This was, I, I, frankly... I found myself with an unexpected week in the schedule. I never, ever have a day, but I had a week because we had to move a video shoot. And I was going to be in Arizona, and the following week suddenly opened up and said, well, what can I do in Arizona? Oh, hello. We'll go out to Gunsight. So ran out there, took this close quarters pistol class. Lead instructor was Steve Tarani. We had him on the show last week. You heard him. Amazing guy. Really impressive background, of course. But more than that, a really good instructor. He understands how to get you to remember things in the way he puts it. Uh, It was fascinating. We had training knives and sticks, and we basically would slow motion, not hard, but slow motion attack each other and learn how to fight those off, how to defend. A few things. I mean, and this was kindergarten level. I understand that. And make no mistake, I do not think I'm trained up to take on a knife attack or anything like that. But it is an eye-opener. Just one thing I'll pass along to you. Talk about training and all. One of the things that Steve said was, look, he was getting ready to go and, you know, he's doing special operations and everybody knows he worked for the CIA and did a lot of interesting things. They were getting ready to go on this mission and 
the head guy says, all right, guys, and these are all like big, tough people who train with guns all the time. And they're really, really good. He says, if you go to guns, you failed. Steve said, they all kind of looked at him like, huh? like but, 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 but that's what we train for all the time. And the point was this, and I, I love the analogy. He said, if you go to guns, you fail three or four times. He says, think about the Titanic. You're on the Titanic. You're going through the ocean. First of all, you have to look for an iceberg. And then, of course, once you look, you have to see and recognize. Because looking doesn't mean seeing. You have to recognize the iceberg. And then once you see the iceberg, you need to avoid the iceberg. And then if you crash into the iceberg, then you go to the lifeboat. Your gun is the lifeboat. But you go to the gun because you fail the other ones. I thought, well, that's really interesting. What a great way to put that. His point is this, and it is, I told him on the last day, I said, one of my big takeaways of all this, man, I've learned to be super ninja, you're a rock and roll operator. Yeah, not really. Okay, but one of my big takeaways is this stuff happens up close. If they get close to you, you are way behind the power curve. You are really in a lot of trouble. And a lot of people train, train, train. They call uh, prison graduate school. That's college for you know, how to knife people, how to you know, stab them, how to shank them, you know, all this other stuff. We learned a lot of this stuff. But my takeaway was this. Increase your awareness. Look for the iceberg. See the iceberg. Avoid the iceberg. In other words, when it all goes down, don't be there. We talked about that a lot of different ways, but I love that way of putting it. See it. You got to look for it. Say, okay, that's a bad situation. Or my spidey sense is going up. Or, you know, ignore that whole, well, I don't want to offend anybody or appear to be offensive, appear to be racist, appear to be whatever it is that's bothering you. Just do what your body is telling you and get away from whatever it is, okay? Don't be there when it all goes down. You got to peel away all that socialized junk we end up getting stuck with sometimes that can put you in a bad place. Just, I'll share a little bit more if you go along. In just a minute, we're going to be taking a, um, a range report from a really well-known listener of Gun Talk. He says the 10 millimeter saved his life. This one I got to hear. Join us, 866-TALK-GUN. I'm Tom Gresham. Good morning, Mr. Gresham. Your mission, should you decide to accept it, is to host a radio show that will bring truth and common sense to the discussion of firearms rights in this country. Good luck, Tom, to you and your Tom Gresham's Gun Talk team. All right, welcome back. Tom Gresham here, 866-TALK-GUN, or just dial Tom Talk Gun. By the way, uh, if you have not subscribed to our newsletter, you need to do that. That's the Truth Squad newsletter. It's free. It's just an email. Uh, you would be hearing about all the things that I'm talking about here and a lot more. I was giving out the information this week about the uh, data I'm starting to receive. Uh, attacks by criminals now, an average of 2.8 attackers per attack. That is 2.8 assailants. And another s- source of uh, data, another piece of information I've been getting is uh, 2.5 hits required to stop an attacker. So let's say 2.8 attackers, and it's going to take you 2.5 hits. Huh. How's that five-shot revolver looking to you these days? Hmm. It's food for thought. It's not often we get a, a regular guest on here who becomes a caller with a range report. But that's exactly what's happening right now. I'd gotten a, uh, a phone call yesterday, a phone message that says, hey, the 10 millimeter saved my life. I'm going, whoa, we got to talk about this. We're joined by Ted Nugent, our good friend, and 10 millimeter aficionado uh, right now. Ted, all right, you got my attention, partner. What the heck happened? Well, happy springtime to you, Tom, and thanks for Gun Talk Radio. It's better than all the rock stations out there these days. But anyhow, <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, I'm a 10 millimeter guy since uh, the Miami shootout in '86 when they went to Jeff Cooper and wanted to design to uh, design a one-stop shot. Uh, handgun cartridge, which of course is a fantasy. There's no such thing. Right. Uh, but but uh, 
with uh, Colonel Cooper's advice and the, our tax dollars, they developed a 10 millimeter, which we all know was uh, too much recoil for some of the pansies in the FBI, so they cut it down to the 40 Smith & Wesson. Being that as it may, I've always carried a gun since I graduated from high school in 1967. I've carried every imaginable caliber and design and action. And I just love marksmanship, the discipline, plus I love life, and I believe in defending it. And I have this real weird, radical idea that I have the right from God to keep and bear arms. So being that as it may, I, I have a beautiful ranch in Texas, and mm -hmm. we have exotic animals from uh, Africa and Asia, as do thousands of ranches in Texas. Sure. In fact, we owe the, uh, the success and the saving of a lot of these species to the landowners in Texas because oh, they're worth with, something for Without a harvest. doubt, because th there are places in the world where these animals are are really in trouble and may not even exist, and yet they've been put on the lifeboat and shipped to Texas, and there's another existence there, and should anything happen in Africa or wherever they come from, it would be possible to actually repopulate them from Texas. So it is a, a fascinating lifeboat for wildlife, the entire state of Texas. Sure, they've actually uh, come from uh, Pakistan and India governments to get some black buck antelope because they had wiped all theirs out because you weren't allowed to hunt them, which means they weren't valuable. So yep. the landowners and agri concerns, they wiped out the black buck antelope for goats and avocados. So wow. they finally realized that wildlife is precious, and it's also a canary in the coal mine of our quality of life here, there, and everywhere. So the story unfolded every day here. I take my dogs, Happy Sadie and Coco, out, and we tree squirrels, chuck the trap line. And I've always carried uh, any manner of glo uh, 10 millimeters, Kimber, the Colt Delta Elite, my Springfield, Smith & Wesson, Remington, Wilson Combat, CZ, Republic Forge. I could go on and on. <laughs> I've carried them all, but I currently carry a Glock because I'm really familiar with it. Mm -hmm. I train every day. I literally have a training uh, range with falling plates, and I train every day because I enjoy it. Plus, mm -hmm. in these crazy times, it's important to have tactical awareness. Right. And I also watch your television shows and the best defense, and I learn from the masters, and I get to train with the masters. So this morning, a week ago, unfolded, where the damn dogs went from a squirrel to what I knew was an, a different animal based on their cadence, and they sure as hell were, they had a hold of a Gemsbach calf. Mm -hmm. And I scrambled over there. I was going to separate the, the dogs. One of them, happy as a cat, a hula, and had this calf in a death grip. Mm -hmm. And I crawled under the bar wire fence, and before I knew it, I'm body slammed to the ground by a really pissed off 800 pound Gemsbach cow with two sabers coming off her head. And Tom, each of those black horns bracketed my head. Oh, Instead geez. of catching me in the head, each horn went to the either side of my head. And, and, well, and let me let me I jump in here. Let me let me tell people the Gimsbach, if you don't know, they are like swords coming out. And Gimsbach can and do kill lions with those. They no know points, how to yes. they know how to kill with those things. Okay, go ahead. Well, you know, I'm not Bruce Lee at the tender age of seventy. I have two brand new knees, which doesn't make me very agile, but Tom in my instinctual storm of self-preservation, I almost was Bruce Lee. By the, the second I hit the ground, my Glock was already cleared from concealment, and her head came into my head, and the first 180 grain, I don't know if it was a Corban or a double tap, but it caught her right under the chin and slightly caused a buckle. Now, this is all happening in nanoseconds. Mm -hmm. And all I can see is black horns. Well, that buckled her a little bit, and the horn went right by my face, and I gave her another one in the throat. That buckled her back. She stumbled, came at me again. This time, the, I twisted quickly, and the horns were on either side of my chest instead of getting me in the chest, and I gave her two quick ones right between the front shoulders as she was facing me head on. That caused her to buckle, and again, I could go on with the tactics and the, the shot placement, but the dogs had her pissed off from the rear, and as she turned to skewer them, I gave her two in the side of the neck. Now she's down, but she's back up, and as she thrust towards me this time, my la I'm shooting none of my shot. They're all one-handed. I'm maniacally clawing backwards on the ground, on mm -hmm, my back, mm -hmm. which, by the way, I've never trained in the past. I'm going to from now on. Uh -huh. And and I'm sure you saw that at gun sight, and we did train that way at gun sight, but I haven't followed up on it. The last 180 grain caught her right in the forehead and did cause her to buckle. 
And as she's running off, I finally had two time shots at 40 and 50 yards, and both of those caught her through the shoulders. Now the dogs are on her. I get over there like I'm a kid, an athlete, and as she's thrusting to kill the dog, she's about to go down, but those sabers are still swinging. And I, from about 25 yards, I was able to have a time shot right behind the ear, and that killed her instantly. That round actually came through her behind her left, her right ear, and came out the, above the left eye. Mm. And uh, I'm telling you, it was out of body. And there, you know, okay, so I'm a pistolero, and I'm athletic, and I'm aware. None of that ex- explains how she missed me with those weapons. I think God has plans for me, but had I not carried a 10 millimeter with the proper ammo, Tom, I would not mm-hmm. be on the phone with you now. Tell you what, I'm going to take a quick break. We can't we can't leave it there. I've got to do this, but we're going to come back and talk with Ted a little bit about the details of this, and kind of his takeaway of what that might mean in terms of you know, how it helped him with his training, more training, and obviously choice of gun and choice of ammo. I'm Tom Gresham. We'll be right back with more gun talk. It's the next generation target pistol, the SW22 Victory from Smith & Wesson. Stainless steel frame, interchangeable match barrel, thumb safety, fiber optic sights, and a Picatinny rail. The SW22 Victory is ready for anything, targets or small game. Also available with a threaded barrel or cryptic camo finish. And it's backed by the Smith & Wesson Lifetime Service Policy. Learn more about the SW22 Victory at smith-wesson.com. Tired of searching the web for the best deals on guns, ammunition, and gear? Download the free Gun Dealio app today for deals and discounts right at your fingertips. Handguns, rifles, shotguns, ammo, optics, lasers, gun safes, targets, gun cleaners, grips, slings, and much, much more. Save money on products you want from the companies you love. New deals, discounts, and rebates added daily. Gun Dealio, available for free in the App Store and Google Play. When someone leaves you their gun collection, you may want a few, but what do you do with the rest? How do you sell them? Who do you call? Well, I call Johnny Dury at Dury's Guns. Whether you're selling one gun or 500, they'll tell you what it's worth and write you a check. Simple, quick, easy, fair. I trust Dury's Guns. Give them a call. Dury'sGuns.com. Hi, this is Ryan Gresham from Gun Talk. If you like guns, you need to enter our biggest giveaway ever at guntalk.com slash win. One person will win more than $11,000 in guns, gear, and accessories to stuff your safe or hit the range. The grand prize includes a night vision scope and rangefinder from ATN, a custom 1911 from Auto Ordnance, a crossbreed holsters concealed carry pack, an FN 509 tactical pistol, the ultimate gun safe organizer pack from Gun Storage Solutions, a custom Glock 22 from Lone Wolf Distributors, clothing, range bags, and more from Proper, Remington's 870 DM and TAC 14, plus two cases of Buckshot, Stag Arms Stag 15 tactical rifle, Tandem Cross Rimfire customization kits, a Ruger Mark IV pistol, and much, much more. Go to guntalk.com slash win to enter. That's guntalk.com slash win. Well, under the holy cow category, we're talking with Ted Nugent uh, right now about uh, he was attacked by a Gimsbach cow. Gimsbach, also known as Oryx, African animal, long three to four and a half foot straight black horns, just straight up sabers. They're very good at killing stuff with them, and this thing is all over them. He used a 10 millimeter. Uh, Ted, question for you. Which model Glock? Was it the, the little one, the 29, or the full size one? I've always carried the 20 since it came out in around 1989, 1990, mm-hmm. and I also carry a 29, and I've got the new Long Slide 40, and they all shoot the same to me. A little bit more buck with the 29 because it's shorter. Sure. 
But I think uh, it's about training, it's about tactics, and, and being one with your weapon. I think most of the tacticians will tell you that you cannot think about getting that gun out. You cannot yes. think about sight alignment. It You have to do it so often. It's like guitar playing and archery and being a good father. you got to do it all the time. And thank God, Tom, at 70, I've been doing this for about... 40, well, more than 40 years, more like 50 years, and uh, that gun was speaking on its own, and every shot uh, went home, I'm, and I was you using know, good it, ammo. I, using, I typically it, use Corbon 180s and uh, Double Tap 180s, going back to the original, you know, Bren 10 right, 180, doing right, right. what, about 1,300 feet a second. I think ours was a little bit hotter, but boy, oh boy, it saved my life. You know, I'm reminded of a friend of mine who's a police uh, officer in uh, Oregon, and he had an incident where he had to shoot a woman, and he said it happened so fast that right after it happened, the officers were saying, it's okay, it's okay, it's over. And he's thinking, how'd this gun get in my hand? Oh, it's out of body. It, it's, you know, I get to train with SWAT. I'm, my guitar's a little sexier than the other guitar players. <laughs> I get to train with these superhumans. I've been doing it since in, in my 20s. And uh, some of that rubs off on you as long as you follow through with it. So the takeaway is that you cannot train too much. Uh, in our daily lives, even if you're not a rancher or a farmer or a gun-carrying guitar player, you got to get that gun out. you got to shoot it. you got to familiarize yourself with it so it's as natural as a fork full of beans. You mm-hmm. haven't missed your mouth with a fork full of beans because you <laughs> do it all the time. Right. And it's so critical. Yeah, it is. And the other part of it, and, you know, people go, well, I just can't shoot that much. Okay. You can do some things. Everybody can do something. If you dry fire practice every single oh, day. Every practice day. Uh, every day. Gr- I'm telling you, all my kids, my grandkids, my, my wife, Shemaine, I make, because they don't train every day like I do, but when they do, I make them dry fire that pistol of choice 50 times before they load it. And I make mm-hmm. them open the cylinder if it's a revolver. I make them pretend to load, close it, work the hammer without looking. I want their finger to know when does this go off. And I'm telling you, when, I, when they dry fire all those uh, times before they load the gun, they shoot incredible small groups because it's all mechanical. Well, you know what? There's not a competitive shooter out there who doesn't dry fire all the time. All the time. Well, you know, I can say this on gun talk, but I do a lot of, you know, other type of interviews, you know, news and talk sure. and sports and rock and roll. And they ask me where my guitar fascination and lifetime comes from. And I talk about discipline and I talk about the marksmanship, sight acquisition, breathing, trigger control, both archery and marksmanship with a firearm. And I got to tell you, uh, I tell people who learn, go to my Facebook. I have turned thousands of people on Facebook on to, to becoming gun aficionados, and I say in the living room, be sure it's empty, mm-hmm. be sure it's empty, be sure it's empty, be sure it's empty, <laughs> but dry fire that gun, shoot along with a TV show. And people go, well, you can't do that. And I go, why not? You just need a lot of trigger time and however you get it. But it, but it, the other thing is you have to get training first so you know how to practice well. Ted, I just want to say uh, thanks for sharing. By the way, um, what was it, like, about a month ago, you're sending me text asking me about a particular 10-millimeter model. And, of course, I'm sending you text back and asking you about, hey, I'm, I'm getting into guitars. And so while Ted knows a ton about guns and guitars, and I know nothing about guitars, it's been a, a bunch of fun, man, i got to tell you. I'm telling you, you get guitar playing down to where you're actually making music and cool licks, and that focus and that samurai, you know, oneness with that instrument is exactly like firearms familiarity. Well, we we shall see. Again, thank you. Are you going to be at the NRA? I, I hope to be in Indianapolis, but I'll be on tour all July and August, and I hope the real rock and rollers will join me for some ballistically coefficient rhythm and blues out there on the road. <laughs> Sounds good. You take care. Best of the family. Thanks, Tom. Godspeed. All right, you take care. Yeah, wow, what a story, huh? Uh, it happens just that fast. And that's one of the things we were working on in this close quarters pistol class. It's like, whoa, that is like fast. And part of that deal is a reaction. Part of it is, honestly, I learned a new way to stand. When you're just walking around and you're in the mall or you're here, I'm not going to even be standing the same way that I used to. I'll, I'll fill you in on that one. It was a, 
it was an eye opener. Uh, yeah, and yes, I'm still sore. And yes, it was worth it. And yes, it was tons of fun. Eight six six Talk Gun. Gun sight is more fun than you can have, uh, you know, more of you. What's that deal? The most fun you can have with your clothes on, but uh, it's fun. I got to tell you that. It's, you know what it is? Learning is fun. Learning is fun, and even more so when you're with interesting people, like-minded people. At this class I just finished, it's interesting. When you go, to, when you watch the uh, the runway warm up to the Oscars and all of that, they always yell, you know, what are you wearing? Who are you wearing, right? Who are you wearing? We kind of do the same thing at this class, you know. What are you carrying? And let's see, we had uh, Glock 19, one guy, another, there was another Tom in the class. He was uh, rocking 1911s and doing a really good job with it. Uh, one lady had the Glock 48, 10 shot, 10 plus 1, and man, she was hammering stuff. And I'm talking about out at 15, 20, 25 yards, making good shots, doing it right. Uh, let's see, we had, a, well, pretty much everything was represented. We had a CZ. Uh, I tried four different guns during the class, which is nuts, because don't do that. Pick one, stick with it, but just the nature of the beast of what I do for a living. I either have to or get to, you choose, play with different guns. I started with the SIG P365. I probably put 400 rounds through that during the class, Sweet pistol. Really like this pistol. A really nice carry pistol. Yes, it's shorter, a little bit smaller. I, I used it with the 12-round mags. Makes it much more shootable, in my view. And um, no problem with it at all. When you got past 15 yards, the short sight radius starts to talk to you a little bit. and makes it a little bit more difficult. And we really did a huge emphasis on headshots. I mean, and not just the head of the cardboard target, but the inside A box. Uh, we really worked on that a lot. Uh, it was explained, says, look, a, a hit in the center, it sets off a timer. And this person may go down at some point when the timer runs out, but you don't know when the timer runs out. A hit at the right part of the head is a switch. It simply turns off the system, and that person's no longer hurting anybody. So we worked on headshots a lot. So you needed to have everything right. You know, grip stance alignment, and we're mostly press, press, press. The trigger press was the main thing. I mentioned that I uh, got schooled up on how do you stand. Because you have this shooting stance, fighting stance, whatever you want to call it. It's basically the same stance you'd have if you were throwing a punch or defending basketball or anything like that. It's a little bit widespread, not real wide. But two things, and these folks who are teaching us are cops, experienced, long-time professional cops. They said, look... When you're standing around anywhere, just start working on, take that stance. It's good for your posture, for one thing. Keep your hands at or above your waist level. Don't be shoving your hands into your pockets. You can't get them out fast. If you got to rest your hands in your pocket, stick your thumb in your pocket. You can get it up quickly that way. Because a lot of what we did were defensive moves, stopping an attack with a stick or somebody comes at you with a knife. you got to slap it away or grab the arm while you are then engaging and getting your pistol out and you're shooting while you're holding on to somebody. Yeah, that's a lot of what we did. Yeah, it's intense. And yes, this is how it works. And this is the, I mean, when you talk to the folks who have been in those fights, who, and then at the end, this was terrific. They set up these scenarios that came out of their experiences. You know, I was going into this house and then I had these two guys do this thing. And so here are the targets, here are the good guys, here are the bad guys, and this is what we had. And yes, it all happened at two feet or it happened at four feet. Or you walked into a, a room and there's three bad guys in there and you can't get away because there's a wall behind you. So now what do you do? Fascinating stuff. Loved it. It was uh, well worthwhile. And a necessary tune-up. It had been way too long since I'd been there or been to a real good shooting school. Now I want to go try some of the others. SIG Academy, some of the others. There are some great schools out there. Yes, it's expensive, so just don't do Starbucks for a year and you can pay for a class like that. Honestly, it really is that way. Our number, 866-TALK-GUN. When we come back, let's talk about women shooting. We had three women in this class that were just tearing it up. Uh, Really good. I'm so happy when I see people like that. Had a 17-year-old girl in another class who came out top shooter. Oh, yeah, next fall, she goes into West Point. 
Hooray for the youngsters of America.